Good evening, and thank you for joining us for Say It Loud, a Black Terp Perspective. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Black Alumni Weekend Steering Committee at the University of Maryland Black Alumni Network. And on behalf of both groups, I would like to welcome you. My name is Cassie Ajmandua, and I serve as the president of the University of Maryland Black Alumni Network and the chair of the Black Alumni Weekend Steering Committee. The Black Alumni Weekend Steering Committee is comprised of 13 Black Terps, ranging from the class of 1978 to a current graduate student. The Steering Committee is the primary internal planning body for the inaugural Black Alumni Weekend, which is to take place in 2022. It is also responsible for planning the preview events this spring as a peek into what you can expect at the in-person event next year. We thought it proper to kick off these preview events during Black History Month. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping rules. This is a live broadcast and will be recorded. Additionally, you will not be able to unmute your microphone, but you may ask questions using the question and answer function. If you need technical assistance, please feel free to message the host directly via the chat. Good evening. My name is Jessica Jackson, and I serve as a member of the Black Alumni Weekend Steering Committee. Thank you to Dr. Nickerson and Black Turp, Femi Sande of Femster Images Production for producing that video. As a follow-up to this event, we will be sending out the full version of that video for you to view at your convenience. Now, I would like to introduce our panelists and moderator for the evening. Our first panelist is Bobby McLeod. Bobby McLeod played football at Maryland and was elected the first president of the Black Student Union. Bobby's classmate, Earl Wynn, served as president of CORE, the antecedent to the BSU, and Bobby was elected to lead the Black Student Union in fall 1968. Currently, he is the president and CEO of Springwater One, McLeod Business Group, and Home Grower. Next, we have Sandra Dawson Long Weaver. Sandra Dawson Long Weaver, 1974 UND graduate, is the managing partner and founder of Tea and Conversations, a networking, communications, and educational event for women. She has a 45 year career working for daily and weekly newspapers, including the Philadelphia Inquirer, where she had various roles, including vice president for newsroom operations and the first female African-American managing editor. Weaver is also a founding member of the National Association of Black Journalists. During her time at Maryland, she served as the second editor of the Black Explosion newspaper. Next, I would like to introduce Brad Braxton, Brad Braxton, a 1987 UMD graduate, is the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for Virginia's Department of Wildlife Resources. While attending the University of Maryland, he was a member of the Chi Delta chapter of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, president of the Panhellenic Council and spokesman for the Black Coalition. Upon graduation, he attended the University of Virginia School of Law. Walt Williams. Walt Williams, known as the Wizard, is a 1992 UMD graduate. He is one of the most dominant and versatile stars in the history of basketball at the University of Maryland. Walt was the seventh pick in the 1992 NBA draft, where he played 11 seasons before beginning his post-playing career as a financial advisor. Along with his Terrapin and NBA teammate, Tony Massenburg, Walt is the co-author of Lessons from Lenny, The Journey Beyond a Shooting Star, a remarkable story about the lasting impact of Maryland legend, Lynn Bias. We are excited to have a current student joining us tonight, Saba Shabaka. Saba Shabaka is a senior at UMD and the co-founder of Black Turps Matter. She is also the founder and CEO of Rendered Inc a sustainable clothing brand she started her sophomore year in college. Saba is majoring in philosophy, politics, and economics, and is, and is a passionate advocate for education and the socioeconomic empowerment of women and girls across the globe. Finally, 
I would like to introduce our moderator for this evening, Dr. Kemp Nickerson. Dr. Nickerson serves as the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences Assistant Dean for Diversity, Diversity Officer and Equity Administrator. He has more than 17 years of experience creating and administering training programs to guide underrepresented minority students into science careers across the spectrum of behavioral and social science disciplines. Dr. Nickerson has also consulted with federal agencies regard, regarding the broadening the participation of underrepresenting ethnic minorities in the sciences. Dr. Nickerson also created the African American History Tour at Maryland a preview of which you just saw in the video. Dr. Nichols, Dr. Nickerson, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Jackson, for that uh, warm introduction of myself and the panelists. And thank you, panelists, for uh, joining us today. Uh, we're so proud uh, to be Terps just like you. And I hope that the people in the audience just recognizes the, the excellence that's represented here. So I want to begin by reminding people, what is a perspective? Well, I want to begin by saying that a perspective is a particular attitudes or way of viewing something. It's a particular point of view of reference. We're going to be fortunate today to hear views of reference or points of views from the panelists today, given that they represent different decades of experiences on this campus. I'm going to take us through this journey by first allowing each panelist one by one to tell us a little bit about what campus was like for them when they were students. And once everyone has had a chance to tell us what the decade of being on this campus represented for them, then we'll go back and forth with some other questions and probably after around 50 minutes or so, we're going to open it up for questions and answers for the audience. So as you're hearing the panelists describe their experiences, if you would please write your questions down or type your questions down, because around 810, you will have an opportunity to either put the questions to the panelists yourself, or I'll read the, uh, the question for you. So let's begin. Uh, Bobby, we're going to come to you first. Uh, would you please share with us your experience on this campus when you attended, and especially being the first elected president of the Black Student Union? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kim. And uh, I'm also a very proud Turk. And uh, I, just to give you a little bit of background, you heard the introduction of the two first African-Americans to attend a university back uh, in, 60, in 55, when I got to the University of Maryland, it was 67. So that's not a long time from the first two to the time that, we, that I was there. When I arrived on the University of Maryland campus, I transferred in from uh, South Dakota University uh, off, on a full football scholarship. I had wanted to go to University of Maryland when I left high school uh, at, you know, because I went to high school in Washington, D.C but I was told that they would not recruit any African-Americans. So I had to seek a college someplace else. So when I got a chance to transfer back, I did, and they were accepting uh, you know, some athletes, black athletes then. Daryl Hill was the first African-American to play at the University of Maryland. Ken, uh, uh, Ken Holiday was another, he's, he's an actor now. Uh, and they were there when I was there. Uh, at the University of Maryland, there were maybe 200, maybe 300 black students total. Uh, prior to that, the University of Maryland College Park campus was not open to blacks. Uh, and the first two that came in, there was a small progression each year of numbers coming in. So a lot of the African-Americans on campus at that time felt very superior to anybody else and or maybe they were just afraid to get in groups of more than four. So there wasn't a lot of communication. Uh, and also at the time, the school outlawed civil rights organizations. Uh, mm -hmm. Earl Wynn uh, fought very hard to get core established on campus, uh, 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 Congress of Racial Equality. He was the president of core. I was the 
uh, public relations uh, person with CORE. And uh, we fought very hard for any type of rights for African-Americans at that time. Uh, do, also during that time period, there was a transition among African-Americans in the United States for civil rights and so on and so forth. You have to understand a lot of that civil rights activity was at historically black colleges or black schools. We were a small minority within a white population. There was some civil rights activity in terms of white kids going on across the nation as well. They organized under uh, the Students for Nonviolence, uh, uh, some society for student non attendance or something that I don't think we don't know. We didn't join their group. They wanted to join ours, but we wouldn't let, allow them to join ours. So during that revolutionary period at that time, we thought that maybe it would be a better situation if we uh, organized under the banner that was being, that came from California as the Black Student Union. So uh, we changed the name CORE to Black Student Union. Uh, and that triggered some uh, activity from the students, Black students on campus. They, 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 we began to have a larger group at our meetings. Uh, we, uh, as the Black Student Unions, we took more of an aggressive attitude toward the administration. We told them, even though we did, we told them we represented all Black students, when we actually represented maybe five that was in our membership. But we took the power position and we would have uh, a plan where uh, was, uh, myself, Erwin, uh, Bob Blanford, and Josie Bass. And in a meeting, we would uh, have uh, Bob Blanford get up with, he had a big dashiki on and he would just go brothers and sisters and just give it all down and just break it down and get everybody angry. Uh, Earl would come up and give the historical psychological aspects of African Americans and culture, this type of thing. Everybody's still all psyched up. And I would come on as a negotiator. I would make the deal, you know, with the students to bring them in and those type of thing. We use that same type of attitude and direction when we met with the administration. Told them we would we represented all of the students and we would do these certain things if things didn't happen. Land would do his thing, Earl would do his thing, I'd negotiate, and Josie would always be there as part of the communication. She if she would be the one that would communicate with them after we after we left. So it was a different type of environment. We were fighting for, there were no black professors, no black deans. Uh, there were only, like I said, around two or 300 black students. Uh, there were, we were in a black community. There was, none of those kids were allowed to come to that school, nor were they allowed to come to, on the campus unless they worked there. Um, and there, were, there was a lot of blacks that worked on campus. We tried to represent them as well. Uh, and we fought very hard. Uh, we. Uh, there was no black student unit office. You guys have a beautiful facility, beautiful offices and everything. We had nothing. So uh, we decided uh, if you go into the student union building, when you first walk into the door off the main uh, drive, main uh, drive, uh, there's a, a door under the steps. We had a janitor, a black janitor opened up the door and it's a big closet. We took over that as our office. We moved everything out of there. We put a desk in there and we dared to defy the school in order to kick us out. They relented. Then we had to fight for a budget where the Black Student Union had no budget, had no operating. The Student, uh, student Union Association, everybody else had budgets. We didn't have a budget. We fought for a budget. We get, finally, we got a little something. Then next year, we got a little bit better. Uh, there were no blacks in the, uh, in the fraternities or sororities. They weren't allowed. Uh, it was the Black Student Union became uh, a, a force where blacks began to feel more comfortable with one another because we were all, all on the same page and they could see that we were fighting for them. There was a, an experiment in the sociology department for, uh, for kids, just an experiment to see if these type of variables fit these type of people. But the black girls were not allowed to participate because for some reason there was genetically some difference or something to that effect. The problem was that they were paying these students. Everybody <laughs> needed money. So why couldn't they be a part of it too? So we made it, we had a big demonstration uh, uh, there on campus. And um, at the time, all of the other universities across the nation were revolutionizing and 
harsh demonstrations and violence and everything was going on. And the dean did not want that at the University of Maryland. So if there was a picture that you showed in your video, a guy in a sweater standing on the steps, that was me. And that was the demonstration that we were talking about. The dean brought me into the building. He said, Bobby, what can we do in order to uh, settle this thing? Because we were going to go in and I don't know what we were going to do, take over the building, do whatever we had decided. But they didn't know what we were going to do either. So he wanted to make a deal um, so that there wouldn't be any violence. And I was the deal maker, and I didn't want any, I, what I wanted was what all, I, all, we, all we wanted. We wanted to make sure that there was some African-American representation at all the student council meetings. We wanted to make sure that there was some African representation at all the student uh, faculty meetings. We wanted to make sure that they, you guys were gonna be uh, definite in recruiting uh, black professors, uh, black deans. We wanted, to, and we wanted the campus to be open more to uh, uh, black enrollment. And we would be a part of that uh, enrollment. And uh, we also wanted to make sure that we had a representative on the Dean's council. And um, so they accepted those things. I, and I, but I told them, I said, look, the people outside on those steps are pissed off and they're angry. We need to do something. I've got to let them walk in here so they can walk around and feel it. I said, you and I have a deal. As long as you do what you do, we're, there's not going to be any violence here. And we walked into the building. People walked around and felt a sense of power. Uh, from that point on, at the University of Maryland, there was never any uh, African-American violence on the campus that caused by an African-American group. And to this day, as I understand and that I see, uh, we, we had a, a, my vice president was a guy named Woody Farrar, very highly intelligent guy, bright. And uh, we selected him because the struggle that we were in, we knew anything could happen to our leaders. And when the student for non-violence, white students were protesting, and I was just walking by, looking up uh, at the uh, at the protest, and the president, the governor at that time was Agnew. I don't know if a lot of you know who Agnew was, but he was one big racist fellow. And the state trooper, instead of talking to the kids, I would talk white kids, saying all this violence stuff. They walked over to me and asked if there was any violence. Would I go peacefully? I said, I have nothing to do with this thing. But that's that was the atmosphere that we were in. And that was well, they had fear of us. Uh, and we had a we had a purpose in mind of things that we wanted to do. And right. what I'm so proud about right now is the fact that uh, all of the achievements that have been made as a result of what those first two black people started back in the 50s to where we are now. A black uh, uh, president of the school. The second one, uh, black deans, professors, it's, it's phenomenal. I'm so proud of everything, so proud of all of you, and very glad to be here. So, Bobby, thank you very much for paving the way. You were a trailblazer. So that we're all oriented, tell us the years that you were uh, at Maryland, un unless I'm asking you an impolite question. <laughs> no, I, that's no problem. I got, I got there at 67, left in 1970. Okay. I, when Woody okay. took over. Great. Well, so those are important stories. You said two things that I might want to come back to, and that is, I think that you said uh, that the university actually outlawed civil rights organizations for students, that's and, right. and, and that's going to be interesting. We we may come back to that, but let's go into the seventies. Okay, is that okay with you? Sure. Okay, so we're going to go to Sandra, and Sandra, would you pick up? where Bobby left off. What was campus like for you in the 70s? And I think a lot of people would be interested in hearing about uh, how the Black explosion came to be and your role in journalism on this campus. And once again, I'm going to remind you that I'm going to give everybody 50, uh, five minutes to sort of uh, lay it out so that everyone else will have an opportunity to uh, say their five minute piece. All right. Well, thank you, Kim. Uh, so Bobby, you left in 1970 and the fall of 1970 is when I arrived. And I was here and graduated in 1974. So when I arrived, um, I believe the statistics said there were about 35,000 students 
and 800 of those students were black students on the campus. So we still were a very uh, small minority of students on the campus. And that worked in some ways to our advantage to get to know each other because there was um, so few of us, we would gather in the uh, BSU and um, you know, make friends. That's how we made friends. You knew where uh, the party was <laughs> for that weekend. That's how we found that out. Uh, that was, you know, that was important back then. Um, but the BSU also became home to the Black Explosion. And my uh, dear friend, uh, Pat Wheeler, was actually the person who started the uh, Black Explosion as an outgrowth of the BSU. And when I arrived, I met her um, trying to figure out what I wanted to do on campus. And that's how we became friends. And, and I started working for the Black Explosion. So I worked on it all four years. And I think the first year it was probably a once a month uh, publication. By the time I graduated, I think we had it coming out like every two weeks. And we would cover what was going on with Black students. We would advocate. Uh, for some of the issues, um, more black professors. You know, I majored in journalism. There was one um, adjunct who was black and his, uh, who, who taught, and I didn't, I didn't even get him for a class, uh, but hardly any prof um, black professors on the campus still. So that was uh, one of the issues. We, um, I remember we had a small room where we would meet and the way newspapers were produced was starting to change. So it was, um, we would send it in to this company and they would put it on uh, this long type and then we would cut and paste it and put wax on it and wax it and then send it out to the printer uh, to come back. And we would uh, try to deliver the paper as well, get it out to as many students as possible. The, um, and we'd recruit, you know, if you could write put two sentences together, we want, come on, we need you on to work for the Black Explosion. We had an artist uh, who would also do a political cartoon for the Black Explosion. Um, and the paper, uh, it still comes out. I think at one point they did change the name of it. Uh, but when I left, it was still the Black Explosion. And uh, it was a, a joy. Uh, it was a, a love to work on the paper um, all the time. And you were always working on it, always trying to find a story. Then the day that you're doing the layout and figuring out it was then it could become an all night event. And one of the things that we did uh, was go to Lido's Pizza after we laid out the paper. I don't know how many of Lido's Pizza is still popular or not. Maybe Saba will tell us that. Um, but it was, uh, that was part of the ritual. Uh, that we went through. And um, the, my work on the Black Explosion did lead me to get my uh, first job in newspapers uh, in Wilmington, Delaware, because people would say, well, why don't you work for the Diamondback? And I had uh, a close friend who would work for the Diamondback, but would not work for the Black Explosion. And we had many discussions about uh, why not work for the Black Explosion? And he viewed his way of getting into journalism, uh, that the path he wanted to take uh, was through the uh, Diamondback. So, but uh, we pushed hard, we covered as many stories, uh, you know, only a few people, but it was a dedicated group of people um, that uh, we had on the staff. And that was, you know, a lot of, uh, it, it, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> as well as hard work uh, back then. We would write about protests. They, in the um, uh, video, you talked about the administration steps and we covered protests that were on the admin steps uh, going on, um, you know, when they happened. Um, but it was, uh, the Black Explosion, I think, was an important part of life beginning in the 70s. There were still, my senior year is when, um, and maybe junior, senior year, the first uh, fraternity came on the campus. And that was, I believe, the Sigmas uh, came on. And then you began to see a little bit of change when they came on because uh, fraternities would have different parties. So you had people kind of going into different groups. 
uh, a little bit more. But we would write about what was going on with Greek life. And then the first sorority on the campus were the AKAs. Um, and they came in my senior year. So that was, uh, that was also part of what was going on. Maryland still had a lot of open space back then. Uh, I lived in Denton Hall, which was also very interesting. And I lived in Denton Hall all four years. And Denton was also one of the first dormitories to uh, go co-ed, which was a very big deal. So that was an issue that we wrote about as well. Um, and there, was, there were Blacks who lived in the dorms, um, also uh, a lot a fairly sizable Black population of commuters. Um, and so when you would meet in the student union, uh, you could also find a game of um, pinochle <laughs> or bidwis that was going on. Uh, but the Black explosion was just a big part of my life when I was on campus. I'm going to stop there and then come back and talk about some other things. Thank you, Sandra. These first two stories are wonderful in that they are weaving a story and they're connecting the dots in ways that I've never heard before as well. So thank you for the Black Alumni Weekend panel to put this together the way you have. So let's go into the 80s, the decade when I was in college and let's go to BRAC and have BRAC tell us what campus was like in the 80s when you were here and you might talk a little bit about the Black Coalition. However, if you do decide to talk about the Black po Coalition, tell us what the Black Coalition was, uh, uh, because I'm not sure everyone's going to be familiar with it. But the 80s, what was what was happening in the 80s? Well, sure. The um, We were very fortunate um, in the 80s. One, you, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Slaughter became president in 82. Um, you know, I had the yard in 83, and basically he was always the, what's chancellor, that they call it at the time, the chancellor of the university. So that was very empowering, um, that, uh, to have this black man, um, you know, leading the school. Also, um, from that time to, from the 70s to when we were there, we really went from less than a thousand black students at one point to this um, explosion of about 10% of the student population where we had um, as, as many as 4,000 black students on the campus. And um, that was just fantastic. We were able to build on um, the community that had been developed um, you know, by those that had come before us. Um, by the time um, the 80s came around, um, we had um, all eight um, organizations um, in the Panhellenic Council. Um, we had, and, and we also had Idol Phi Theta, which is now a part of the Panel Pan Council. So um, we just had this very vibrant thing going on. It was the um, early days of hip hop, and that affected um, just how you know we viewed um, so much of what was going on at the time. Plus, we had the uh, blessing of um, still being a bit of an enigma. Um, as Black people were on campus, and therefore not having a lot of administrative oversight um, at that time, which allowed us to do many of the things, um, you know, that we wanted to do in these amazing facilities, um, you know, as was mentioned before. But these amazing facilities, this Black Greek life, this vibrant Black community, um, Maryland really at that time became a hub for Black college life in the D.C. area. Um, you know, you can go back and look at um, posters from homecoming shows, which featured um, many of the top hip hop acts of the, you know, of the time. Um, um, we had the um, step show, the Greek step show um, became one of the big things that happened in that fall. We moved it into Cold Field House um, and it became a huge moneymaker for our um, organizations. And then we began to have national acts affiliated with that. Um, the first time I saw Queen Latifah was at the 1988 um, step ship um, and Cole Fieldhouse at the, um, at the University of Maryland. And um, it was really just a, it was just a, a, a different time. And I say this not to be Pollyanna. Um, I think we just hit um, a very important period um, because of what was done before, because of what was going on in administration. There were so many active black faculty and staff 
Um, I had a very, very different experience when I went to UB, um, UVA for law school. So it's not, you know, I, I don't think everything is always positive like this, but it was a great experience. Now, the Black Coalition was an effort to bring together and coordinate all of these vibrant Black organizations that were happening at this time. There were um, several, um, you know, N Nesby chapter and business uh, chapter, but um, really the three big ones were the Panel and the Council, the Black Student Union, and the NAACP. We were doing so much programming and having so many different types of events that we said we need to come together to make sure that we're maximizing and aligning all of the things that we um, did. At the present time, the NAACP, Craig Harris, um, BSU was uh, Ed um, Martin and Cameron Harris, and uh, Wayne Bruce was PhD, then I took on after him, and we went from there. Um, the Black Coalition became very um, important, specifically when it came time to um, get funding. It was mentioned earlier that um, getting our um, organizations funded was very important. Uh, a group of students um, who called themselves the Monarchists, um, and they actually would elect a king and not um, a president, um, took over the Student Government Association. Um, the monarchists essentially um, came up with different funding ideas. I, I, I don't necessarily know if they were targeting us, but it was devastating to um, the ability for Black organizations to program and the way they decided that they want to approach funding. Um, so um, essentially, um, the Black Coalition went to war with the monarchists. Um, I became spokesman not because... Um, you know, some big election or anything, I just had the biggest mouth. And so they pushed me out there and said, hey, you know, yeah, he, he's gonna he's gonna do talk. But we were all very much in line because we recognized that um, each of the organizations had an important um, role within the black community. Um, during our war with the Monarch, it's a very enterprising um, young white woman um, in a sorority decided to come to us and say, hey, I want to put together a um, ticket, um, a multiracial, multicultural um, ticket to run against the monarchists and um, come together and uh, defeat them. And we want you to put people on it. So um, we basically had several members of the Black community, um, many in PHC, um, some officers and other organizations to become a part of that ticket. And um, we worked carpools and um, aligned with the Interfraternity Council and did all of these things and, 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 and you know, all the outreach and advertising and campaigning and all for this group. Um, so much so that um, the next day when the election was over, the uh, Diamondback said, you know, the Black Coalition delivers victory for whoever. And um, it was actually, um, really recognize that through um, our action and through um, our sheer numbers and our um, you know lack of um, you know, uh, apathy within the uh, community, we were able to make a change and bring about um, you know a, a campus political change. And you know we got the rules changed and and we were able to fund, make sure that our organizations were funded in such a way that we could continue to um, bring the type of programming and all to the campus that we, um, that we were used to. And um, it was a, you know, it was a time when we flexed our muscles, but we were able to do that because of the foundation that had been laid prior to us getting there. Thank you, Bracken. And, and what I really appreciate about what you just said is you're recognizing the foundation that was laid for you from people who came before you in the 70s and the 60s. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to go to Walt next, who uh, uh, you people in the 80s and 70s and 60s probably consider a baby. But I'm sitting here <laughs> looking at him. He has all this gray gristle. All in this him. gray. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, the 90s uh, is an important era. Uh, you were an athlete as well. And athletes were some of the first students actually admitted to college campuses, period, for various reasons. But I don't want you to talk about it in general. 
I want you to be as specific as you can to tell us what it, what was it like being on this campus in the 90s as a black athlete and as a black student athlete? Well, first of all, I just want to say, man, I appreciate the stories before me. I mean, uh, man, that, that's just amazing, uh, uh, the things that were done uh, before, before I attended the University of Maryland. Uh, for me, uh, man, it was, it was just a totally different environment for me. Um, when I came into the university, I certainly knew uh, about uh, Billy Jones, the, the first uh, African-American to, to play on the basketball team in the ACC. Um, I was certainly aware that uh, uh, Coach Bob Wade at the time, who was the coach who, who, was, who recruited me, uh, was the first African-American uh, head coach in the, in the ACC. So I, I certainly was aware of those things. And, uh, you know, I was a kid uh, born in, in uh, Northeast Washington, D.C. And, and raised in Prince George's County. And I had never been in a predominantly white or even a diverse environment. Um, so, so every aspect of college life was just uh, something that was an, an adjustment for me and something that was different than the way uh, I had grew up. But um, we had stru structure uh, really kind of isolated me from um, uh, the campus. I mean, our days were planned. We would wake up in the morning, uh, eat breakfast. Uh, then we would go to class and, and they helped us put our schedules together so that uh, we can have time to eat some lunch in between classes. And uh, then we would have practice and then we would have a couple of hours of study hall. So by the time my day was over, it would be, you know, about eight o'clock at night. And so we, 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 we had so little free time to ourselves and uh, we lived on the south side of campus. It's, it's certainly not, uh, the campus it is now, uh, but we lived on the south side of campus where it was kind of separated. It was mostly uh, majority uh, athletes on that side of the campus, and the majority of the student body stayed on the north side, uh, like Miss Sandra talked about earlier, Denton Hall, the Plato Hall, and, and and those type of things. So, in order for us to interact with the majority of the campus, we had to seek that out, and so oftentimes uh, our social activities consisted of you know, going to the bar on Route 1 from time to time or attending campus parties, sorority frat parties with, um, um, you know, the Qs or uh, Deltas, what, what have you. And so that was our, that was our um, way to be able to um, associate with the, with the rest of the campus. So um, it, was, it was kind of a situation where um, I really didn't, uh, experience uh, the totality of what, uh, what college was like. As I uh, got older in, in, in college and, and started to, you know, in my sophomore, junior year, I started to get better and better in basketball, which isolated me a bit more because uh, um, it was so much spotlight on, on, on me. And I, I was not used to that at all. And, uh, you know, I. I, I'm, I'm a sh I was a shy person at that time. And so all of this publicity and notoriety, I, I was not used to that. And so I shied away from it. So um, most oftentimes when I did have free time, I stayed in my room. And uh, so it was, uh, but, but on the University of Maryland's campus, it was, it was a great experience for me because I got the opportunity to uh, have some life, uh, lifelong friendships. Um, um, the opportunities that I, or the, um, the times that I did um, uh, come out and, and go to parties and things like that. I established a lot of friendships and had some great times with my friends. So, but um, when I hear everybody else's story, I feel like, man, I, 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 I lived in privilege um, on, on campus. Uh, I can remember uh, th this lady, uh, her name is uh, Mrs. Martha Hardy, and she used to work in the uh, Roy Rogers in the student union. And, uh, um, you know, during the course of the day, I would go through there and, uh, you know, when she saw me in there, she would give me free food and she would make sure everybody who worked there, you know, when they saw me come through, everybody would give me free food. And so, you know, things like that would happen for me. So I did not experience uh, uh, 
things like uh, my previous, the previous uh, guests, uh, it was very, um, it was very privileged for me. It was people were were trying to uh, bend over backwards to to do things for me and to make sure that I had a great experience in college. So uh, that's why I wanted to start off with just saying that, man, I appreciate uh, the things that were done beforehand because I know that I would not have been able to experience college life like I did had it not been. Uh, uh, for our previous guests. Well, well, thanks, Walt. And I think the audience appreciates your recognition of, of the special handling that uh, athletes often get. But uh, what doesn't always happen, and you actually just demonstrated it, is athletes often don't reach back and say, listen, I know I had a little bit better than you, and I know other people made it good for me, and I appreciate that. And that, and that goes a long way. So uh, the next person we're going to hear from is uh, Ms. Shibaka. And I'm going to give you a tall order, but I know that you can handle it because you're a very smart, intelligent young lady. So I want you to attack two things for us. You're a current student now and you're about to graduate. So I do want you to tell us what the University of Maryland College Park campus has been like for you, but I also want to put a twist on it. I want you to think about all the stories that you've just heard, and I want you to reflect on them, and I want you to integrate them in your answer in terms of your understanding of how their trailblazing work uh, impacted what your experience was. Is that too much for you to handle? No, it's not. But I'm know. happy. I'm glad I took notes. <laughs> That's what I will say, that I am glad I took notes. Well, you are a Terp, and you are super smart, so... <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. Thank you uh, to Black Tech alumni for uh, inviting me. Um, I'm just so humbled. I, I guess y'all set me up to represent the entire last 20, 20, I mean, 20 years of the school, which is kind of crazy, but I will definitely try my hardest. Um, so my name is Saba Shabaka. I am a senior at Maryland and my major is philosophy, politics and economics. And um, you know, when thinking about how I was going to introduce myself for this, it was pretty hard. I was like, what is the best context? Because um, as a Black woman, you know, we all have so many intersections. Um, but since it is Black History Month, I'm going to definitely try and expand on everything that Maryland has given me and the opportunity of being from the great state of Maryland. Um, I claim Prince George's County. I was raised in Bowie, Maryland. Um, and I really grew, grew up all over Maryland. So I'm just... Um, really happy to be able to say that <laughs> and uh yeah so at Maryland honestly I guess intertwining everything that I've heard um the very first thing that stuck out to me is definitely the Black Student Union um at Maryland I was actually my freshman year I was the president of the Black Student Union Freshman Council and I was only able to do that because my friends that were a year older than me that I met when I was in high school told me how important the Black Student Union was and how important it was to get involved. So um, I guess to even just back it up, I'm just thankful for my friends from high school. I went to two different high schools in Maryland, um, Springbrook High School in Montgomery County and um, Arundel High School in Anne Arundel County. That's where I graduated from. And um, a bunch of different experiences in high school, but the best one I could say was playing basketball. Um, because that was actually my first leadership experience ever. I was the captain of the basketball team um, and I was a power forward. And when I was at uh, Springbrook, I actually played number 42, just like uh, the Wizards. So I'm pretty, pretty happy to be able to say that. And then um, when I went to um, Arundel, I graduated and I was number 24, like the best basketball player on the, um, that's ever existed, Kobe Bryant. And so coming into college and joining um, the Black Student Union definitely set a foundation um, for me that I could literally never forget. Those are my first couple of friends outside of my family. And so uh, matriculating through college, I was able to um, also join the Ethiopian Eritrean Student Association because I am Ethiopian. And um, I was the public relations chair. So it was very interesting to hear um, Bobby, that you that you also served as uh, public relations because it's just like wow, like what like public relations um, that entire chair like I was a computer science major when I came into college so I had no business I thought being in PR but it definitely um, opened me up to so many things and I'm so thankful that I got to 
experienced that with the Ethiopian Eritrean Student Association. Um, so then my junior year, actually, I was, or my sophomore year, I was elected the president of the Black Honors Caucus. Um, my freshman year, I had served my second semester as their uh, um, executive member at large, just because of my connections to the community and all the friends that I had made in my freshman year. Um, but my sophomore year, I was elected the president of the Black Honors Caucus, and that was so amazing. The advisor for the Black Honors Caucus when I was president was Dr. Tracy Dula, who taught me so much about Black history, taught me about um, Hiram Whittle. And so it's crazy to think that I was the president of the Black Honors Caucus when I first found out about him, but you know, so inspired by him. And um, yeah, uh, as y'all can tell, I'm kind of nervous to be around all these uh, legendary people right now, but. Tell us a little bit about your involvement and your founding of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement here on campus or Black Terps Matter, because that's an important part of your identity that, uh, to be honest, it, it's going to be a legacy that I hope uh, lives well beyond you. And, and then after you talk about Black Terps Matter, I'm going to shift it and remix it and have you guys talk to each other and ask each other questions. Cool, sounds good. Yes, Black Terps Matter. So um, whenever I talk about Black Terps Matter, I always have to give an acknowledgement to the fact that we are not the first people that ever said Black Terps Matter. I think everyone that's sitting here right now is the epitome of Black Terps Matter because it's people saying that Black students at UMD do indeed matter, that we deserve a voice. So thank you again to everyone on the panel. But we, um, meaning uh, the three people, three Black women that started it, myself, Saba Shabaka, Nadia Ousu, and <clears throat> Alyssa Conway, um, three seniors at the University of Maryland. Um, Nadia actually first asked us to come together to have a protest on, um, on campus on June 25th. And um, I agreed, I, I told her I would help. And so it was at that protest that more than 200 students, faculty, and administrators came out. And um, the, the incoming president actually came. It was on June 25th and he started on July 1st, 2020. So before he actually started his tenure, he came out and, and listened to us, which we really appreciated. Um, and after that protest, everyone told us, you know, we had to keep going, we had to keep organizing. So we used that momentum to um, take it from protest into Zoom rooms and working groups. And um, we delivered the list, um, the administration, a list of 10 demands on July 17th, 2020, which was actually the same day as John, that John Lewis died. Um, someone that I'm extremely inspired by. And I wear this hat um, basically every time that I leave out my house because it's, it's always a protest. Um, but yeah, we delivered the list of demands on, in July. And um, throughout the next eight months, we worked um, in a, a uh, Black student leader uh, working group with um, more than 30 other student groups on campus to um, narrow down a list of 25 demands that we delivered to the administration. So in December, we actually were able to get um, a list of 25 demands agreed upon by the administration, um, which is something that uh, has not happened in a very long time. And so it was really just on the shoulders of giants that we were able to get that done along with um, President Pines the second um, ever Black president of the University of Maryland. So I'm just here in a very thankful spot, um, it being February, Black History Month, and uh, speaking on for you know a lot of Blacks, on behalf of a lot of Black students who are in, so inspired by like so many of you. So just thank you all. So we're gonna turn to let you ask each other questions for 10 minutes, and then we're gonna open it up. But before we do that, I wanna point out something uh, that people have to understand. Uh, Bobby started us off by reminding us that even when he got to campus, uh, there were maybe 67 African Americans on campus. Now, fast forward to today. Uh, Saba can attest to this. Our university is so great that we have more than just the Black Student Union. Uh, the East Africans have their own organization. West Africans have an organization. Caribbeans have their organizations. Uh, the diversity of the African diaspora on this campus is so great. And once again, if I were in my home state of, of Texas, maybe there would be one black group. But to have East African, West African, Caribbean, African American experiences all together, I think represents the best of what this country has to offer, best of what this continent has to offer. And once again, 
uh, I can only name a handful of universities that have that critical mass of students from different parts of the globe that can bring that together. So uh, thanks for representing East Africa, uh, Saba. Uh, and I noticed that for Black Terps Matter, started by an East African, a West African, and an African American. So uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, but hey, panelists, talk to each other. Ask someone a question based on what they shared with us. Let's do that for about seven or eight minutes. Then at 810, let's open it up and see what the audience has to ask you. Well, let me just say, uh, Walt, what you represent, Sandra, George, and Saba, what you guys represent is everything that we thought could happen back then. And we saw, I, I was on the University of Maryland football team, and, but they only wanted to give me a part scholarship. And I saw what the, uh, what the other guys were getting, the type of treatment uh, and, and everything. And we wanted that for us too. So I'm very proud that you got a privileged attitude and treatment and everything at the University of Maryland. That's what you should have got. And we wanted that for everybody else, like the, the publications, the, uh, the different the societies that were developed, uh, the, the segregation of the, uh, of, of the uh, different African groups. That's what we should do. That's what you should have done because I'm, I was proud of Washington, D.C. We had enough kids in D.C. We would have had a little group sitting somewhere at a table talking about things. But at the time, a year before I got there, uh, they, uh, two years before I got there, they would not allow any African-Americans from out of state. You could only come for the college park campus. You could only come if you were in state. Uh, so all of these things have changed and, and you guys were part of that change and, and other African-American students like you at the school were part of that change. And the university needed, needed it. It's a better place for it. This country is a better place for it. The state of Maryland is a better place for it. So I'm very proud and happy that all of you guys, to hear all of this, this is just wonderful. And I'm sure uh, I'd like to share this because the group of blacks that were there when I was there, uh, I see them every once in a while. We're, we're tight. Uh, we, you know, it was a small group, so we all knew each other. And they would be proud to hear these things and know these things. Uh, because a lot of times when we left there, we had no interest in coming back you know, at all because it was a tough time. You know, uh, we won some successes, but we never got into the political thing, George, like you guys, if we wanted to. Uh, I was the first black person on the student council association that went to that little retreat they have up in the, but not the, near that little Patuxent River, whatever it's called. Uh, so, you know, well, I'm proud of where things are right now. So I, I don't have any questions. I'm just proud of it. That's all it is. Hey, I, I've got a question for Walt. Um, and that is, you know, one, one thing that happened during the eighties, a pivotal, period, a pivotal thing in Maryland was, of course, the tragic death of Lynn Bias. And um, 1986, and I don't think anybody that was in school with us at that time doesn't remember exactly what they were doing the moment they heard about that. Um, Lynn was more, Lynn was very much a part of our community. Um, you know, not just a superstar basketball player, but, you know, someone who was at the parties and knew everybody and and you know, and actually, you know, in the in, in the classes, uh, you know, and so as a, a player that came after that, obviously that sort of ushered out the end of the Lefty Giselle days, the beginning of the Bob Wade days. You know, as a player that came after that, how did that? And I haven't read your book, but now that I know about it, I'm gonna get it. Yeah. How did that impact? Right, that's it. Uh, how did that impact? You know, athletics from that point on, how did it impact you in your decision to come to Maryland? Well, I can tell you this, uh, just Lynn Bias, who he was and um, the impact that he had on not only uh, me individually, but our community and the University of Maryland and uh, um, 
just uh, laws and and just his impact in general what is what compelled uh, myself and Tony Massenberg to write this book. We felt like the uh, people as a whole understood or knew about the tragedy surrounding his death, but few knew the impact that he had on us uh, and as a community. I remember as a little kid uh, going out on a, on a blacktop and playing basketball and pretending to be him. And that had a lasting impression on me because when it was time for me to make my decision, I remembered those things. I wanted to have that same impact. I wanted the kids from my community to go out and play basketball and pretend like they were me. And so um, that was probably one of the biggest reasons, if not the biggest reason why, why I chose the University of Maryland. I grew up a Georgetown Hoyer fan as a kid with John Thompson and, and all of that. And then I got the opportunity to see Lynn Bias and he forever changed uh, for, forever changed me. And so I wanted to have that impact on my community. Uh, that was the reason why I wore the high socks and, and I wore my clothes when I played the game the way I did because I wanted to represent where I came from. And Lynn Bias was a big part of that. And so I wanted to have that lasting impression. And so, um, you know, going through, um, um, going through that situation with Lynn Bias, I mean, he was my idol, it was, it was crushing to me, to for him, his death was crushing to me. And um, it was sort of a negative description of the university following that. And that wasn't the impression that I had. And so it was something that was in the back of my mind that when I go here, I'm gonna show everybody that this university is a great university. And um, I, I was, I was uh, motivated by that. And uh, also to be able to, to play for a guy like uh, Coach Bob Wade, um, you know, when, when he came into my home to talk to my parents, my parents loved him. But for me, it wasn't just about the basketball part of it. He reminded me of my grandfather, you know, the, his personality, his character, the way he, the way he talked. I mean, and so I, I had a comfort level for, with him very early on. And so it, it did impact me uh, when he was fired or resigned, forced resignation, whatever you want to say. Um, after my freshman year, I had the opportunity to be there with uh, uh, Chancellor Slaughter uh, for one year. And so when that when that situation happened, I really uh, was soul searching to, to see what I want to do. Uh, because up until that point, everything was laid out. You just followed the plan. Like I mentioned earlier, our, our days were planned and then you just follow the process. But when that happened, now it, it, it forced me to, now I have to make decisions here. I have to take ownership of my path. And so uh, what was overwhelming for me is that the reason why I, I went to the University of Maryland is because I wanted to have the impact that Lynn Bias had. And I had established a, a family relationship with my teammates. And so that ultimately led me to, to go, not only go there, but to stay there. You know, one of my favorite songs is a Frank, Frankie Beverly song, Joy and Pain. And uh, University of Maryland experience is like that, joys and pain. And so thank you for telling that story. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask us to stop and think about two lives of African-American men who recently were lost on this campus. Jordan McNair, a football player, and Lieutenant Richard Collins III, RIP. Uh, and we now know that those lives of black men, black bodies on this campus will also forever change this campus. And I'm very grateful to President Pines and the efforts he's making for truth and reconciliation and accountability uh, for the university. And so RIP to Mr. Uh, McNair and Mr. Collins. Uh, and uh, with that moment of silence, I want to open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, Beth and Mary, uh, I mean, uh, Mary and Erica have been monitoring the questions for me, and they may help me figure out which questions might be the best questions to approach right now. Uh, I think I'm going to go to the Q&A and, um, and I'm going to start with the question from Tawana Baskerville. 
And Tawana asks, how do you think the current climate has impacted the athletes on campus now? And I would even put a friendly amendment on that, Walt, or for any of you, and that is we're living in an age where many college athletes have uh, joined in solidarity, the movement that Colin Kaepernick has started. And once upon a time, uh, athletes were told to shut up and dribble, but those days are gone now. So Walt or anyone, would you wanna approach uh, Tawana's question? How do you think the current climate has impacted athletes on campus now? Well, I, I can tell you this, when you, when you talk to the old players, they always say, oh, the younger players, the, the players of today, they're not like we used to be. And, and they're correct in most respects. And, and, and where they are um, uh, correct also is that I remember playing the game and, and we did not uh, take on uh, political issues as much as, as athletes. And so, um, as a whole, you would have some standouts, but as a whole, you didn't see that. And and uh, oh man, it's just it's just so refreshing to see uh, these young kids just taking um, uh, a hold of things and, and really uh, being to the forefront of, of social issues, understanding their impact on the community, and understanding that um, they uh, kids do follow. Uh, they are huge role models and, and taking on that responsibility, especially when you're talking about college students. Uh, we were, I remember in, in my college days, we, we were just playing basketball, just trying to play. Um, didn't really uh, uh, take a step back and, and pay attention to, to issues like this. And so it's, it's certainly, uh, man, it's, it's, a, it's a proud moment to see uh, uh, these kids do it in such large numbers. Uh, it seems like it's, it's everywhere and it's not just an isolated incidents where you have one or two or the, a star player here or there, it's as a whole. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's a great feeling to see uh, these kids take, take that on and I, I certainly got to tip my hat to them. Okay. Sandra, we have a question for you. Why do you think so many students chose to work on the Black Explosion instead of the Diamondback? Do you think working on a black newspaper limited student opportunities in journalism and related professions? Uh, that's a very good question. Well, when I was at Maryland uh, in the early 70s, the Diamondback was not a welcoming publication. Uh, blacks were not really welcome there. Uh, they didn't try to recruit any black students to work on the publication. So having the uh, black explosion was a way for our voices uh, to be heard and to get out news of what was going on with black students. The Diamondback certainly did not really cover um, what was going on on black student life as, as well. So, uh, and even um, I've talked to students in the 2000s who reached out through NABJ and had questions about, you know, can you help us? And, you know, I'm trying to do this. I want to go into journalism, but I'm having issues. So you still get involved, um, you know, where we can. Uh, did it, is, does it hold back? No, the, uh, working for the black press has never held back uh, anyone who wants to uh, work in this business. It's, it is a different experience that you bring to the table, whether you work for the white press, the majority white press, or you work for the black press. But that experience that you bring enriches that publication because of the diversity of the voices uh, that are there. So um, no, but the, the Diamondback just you know didn't want us. And one of the things that was also important uh, that you learned by working for the uh, black explosion and being the editor was how to uh, handle a budget. Bobby talked about a budget for BSU and Black Explosion. We had to also learn how to handle a budget. And that was one of the things was like, you know, to detail what was needed, whether it was uh, photography equipment or whatever was needed, but you had to um, once a year go before a board that oversaw publications and put in your bid for a budget and be able to manage it. So those experiences that you have 
make you a better candidate for any position that you're looking for in the media. Okay. So here's something for each of you, because all of you were students, so you all had to go to class, I hope. Uh, uh, I married the woman that I started dating in college, and I tease her that uh, sometimes uh, I would see her out on the yard skipping class, but I know that none of y'all did that. But uh, how would you describe your classroom experiences during your individual time frames at UMD? And, you know, once again, each of you attended class. So if you could be brief, I'd like to start with Bobby and go through Sandra, George, Walton, end up with Saba. But we don't have a lot of time for uh, a, a drawn out answer. But tell us what the classroom experiences were like for you. Uh, well, that's I'm very glad you brought this up because uh, you have to understand during the 60s, that was the, the peak of the revolution, the Black Revolution, and all across the United States. And we were fine with that, but the white population was afraid of that. That was their fear, especially on a Black campus, on a white campus, to have these people riding and tearing up the campus. And if they started to, uh, they have to take some force on it. So it was during that time. I, so as president of the Black Student Union, I was in a meeting at the president's office or the dean's office or the police station or someplace all the time. And that's why we chose Woody as the vice president because I knew and I couldn't be out of, I was gonna be out of class. There was gonna, something gonna happen with the grades. You know, so we chose a backup to me being there because I was out of class a lot. And so uh, I didn't get kicked out of school, but my wife, my, my next wife, she had a baby. So we, I had to leave school and Woody took over. So, uh, but we had our, during that time I was there, we set up the logistics of how things were going to operate with uh, black students representing uh, the black population on various councils and various staff in an organized manner. But prior to that time, I was the person and everything I was involved. And anytime something happened, the dean would call me. Anytime something happened, the dean would call. And I would have to go, so I was not in class most of the time. Yeah, and so it, it took away from your classroom experiences. It took away from the class, Yeah, absolutely. So Sandra, what were your classroom experiences? Uh, just going to class. Um, most of my class, I was the only black person in many of the classes. And, you know, Maryland has those large lecture halls, so it's also difficult to really connect um, with a lot of people in those. And then going to the smaller class when they would break it up with the uh, maybe a graduate student who's teaching the um, smaller section still didn't. Um, I was still mostly the only black person in all the classes that I was taking. So it was lonely in some respects because I didn't really have somebody I could call on to say, well, what was that assignment? What could, you know, what did I miss? How, how are we doing this? It was, I really had to hunker down and pay attention <laughs> and make sure that I got it the first time around uh, because otherwise I would not have um, done as well as, you know, I should have, I should have done better there were a few classes that I did miss. <laughs> Brack? <laughs> sure. Well, um, I'm going to give sort of two perspectives. One, my personal perspective, um, you know, I, yeah, I came to Maryland for the fight. Uh, I came to Maryland to be one of the, you know, one of the few in the class to speak up and present a position that people didn't necessarily see. So for me, it was fine. I wasn't in a, I was in a fairly small major and, you know, classes of 20 and 30 and what have you. So, um, you know, I actually look forward to, you know, the give and take and the go back. And then of course I, I also had, I was getting an Afro-American studies certificate. So you had home to, and you had a place to go and, you know, and sort of get powered up and feel good and heal um, as well. Um, the other perspective um, is really for many of the other folks. Maryland, we only had about a 25% graduation rate um, after five years during that time, which was, that was the same um, of the 80s. And part of that was because of what was happening in the classroom. Many people came, um, you know, seeking, you know, you know, engineering business, all those, and many of those weeder courses, um, many of those um, um, areas required people to work together. I know people felt shut out um, from that. Um, we created this um, very nurturing environment, you know, in the student union. 
Um, uh, Walt mentioned Roy Rogers, you know, um, that, you know, and too many times people will come there and they'd say, you know what, I'm going to sit here with my people rather than go and face that, you know, what we have to deal with in class. I think that was a big contributor to um, some of the um, issues we had with people not doing as well academically as we should. Uh, we addressed some of that with um, an, a, a program called the Retention Orientation and Personal Enrichment Seminar, which we put together to try and help close some of those um, you know, uh, gaps that people may have in adjusting to um, a place like Maryland. But um, I know there were many people that struggled in by us creating this community in this nurturing community, I think it made it so people didn't really follow through as much in the on the academic side sometime and chose, you know, the warmth of being with uh, our, our folks. And I'm, I'm glad to see much of that has been fixed over the time. But it was it was challenging and, and not and not everybody um, um, thrived in it, unfortunately. Well, uh, what were your classroom experiences like? Yeah. With the, with the death of Lynn Bias, it uncovered um, a lot of things. I mean, one of the things it uncovered was uh, the lack of academic support for the student athlete. And so I benefited from, from that uh, when I went to the university. I had an academic advisor named uh, Dr. Noel Myricks. And uh, I would sit down and have conversations with him. And from our conversations, he would help me go through uh, my semester in, in the classes that he thought would be of advantage to me based on what my interests were. I had no idea. I was there, I wanted to play basketball. I knew in the back of my mind, my mother didn't care anything about basketball. She wanted me to get my degree. So I knew I had to get my schoolwork done. And so Dr. Noel Myricks was huge in, in my um, uh, achievement of that. He was with me, he walked me through it every step of the way, just making sure that I was on par with the classes that I needed to take in order to graduate. I mean, he took it personally that, that I graduated. And so he was very instrumental in that, not only with the class that I took, but making sure that um, uh, he followed up with me, making sure that I got my classwork done, I had all the resources that I needed, and all of that. So uh, Dr. Noel Marix was huge for me and my success and, and the reason how I got my uh, degree in four years uh, with while, while playing basketball. I remember early on, like Sandra mentioned, uh, those, those lecture classes, uh, that was early in my, my uh, freshman year. So it was an adjustment for me. I wasn't used to uh, being in a lecture hall or things like that. So it was an adjustment period for me as well. But like I said, uh, Dr. Noel Myricks was huge in, in helping me uh, make that adjustment. Okay, Ms. Shibaka, what, what have classes been like for you? And uh, just to warn everyone, uh, the organizers want us to wrap up at seven at 825. We're almost there. So we're gonna have to hustle. Yeah, I mean, I've taken so many classes at um, UMD. I did start off as a computer science major. So um, the biggest thing that I can say out of my experiences in my classes that it, it wasn't, it has never been very diverse. I've always wished that there could be more black people in my classes. But um, the experience on campus has, you know, I lived in Easton, I lived in Dorchester, I lived in South Campus Commons, lived all around campus, and I've been able to, uh, you know, utilize so many of the resources on campus through the different clubs. So that really um, shaped my experience, everything that I got into. But I know that if I didn't, if I wasn't active, my experience on campus would be completely different. So it just reminds me that, you know, these experiences are only what you make of it. So I encourage if there's any students that are watching right now, definitely get involved and get as active as possible in college. Okay, I'm gonna take moderator's privilege and steal one minute, but you have to work with me and you have to be quick. Uh, people wanna know what is the number one way that black Terps or anyone can make a substantial difference in the communities with the university. And you gotta do this quickly. So let's start with Bobby, quickly. Just what's the number one way people can do to make a substantial difference? Uh, just remember your roots and have a direction as to where you're going and be all you can be and take advantage of that education that they're giving you because you're learning with all, what they, all of them are learning. So that's, that's the key. They thought we were coming after their girls, but we were really coming after their education. That's the, what they didn't get. That's what you need to get. Sandra. 
So I, I think um, letting, uh, reaching out, reaching back and letting uh, current perps know uh, that we're available to offer advice, to be a support to them. And I think that's one of the ways that we can do that. As Brack. well as women. Um, Brack. Women. Yeah. Um, look at all the blood spilled in that Maryland mud. Um, claim it, recognize that it is your school it is not um, their school that I'm attending. Um, take ownership in it. Um, when you're an alum, um, try to be as relevant as possible uh, and try and be valuable to not just the students there, but to the university itself. It's our university um, as much as it is anyone else's. You know, the, you know the, the, it's in our DNA and we're in Maryland's DNA. And um, you know, and make sure you claim it, and 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 not just be consumers, but be owners. Well, uh, just supporting one another. I think we have so many talented people uh, that's been at the University of Maryland, entrepreneurs, people that are doing amazing things. For instance, that shirt Saba got on. That's hers, you know, support instead of going out, you know, when, when possible, instead of going out and getting you maybe a Nike shirt or something, maybe you could get one of those shirts that Saba have on. So I, I just think it's important for us to support one another. Saba, you get the last word. Thank you so much, Walt. Yep. And if you guys want to get it, you can follow at rendered ink on Instagram. But anyways, um, believe in yourself. Stay fearless. I mean, that's the motto of the University of Maryland. That's something that's, um, you know, told me. And just to, you know, reiterate something that someone else said, no one can tell you what's in your head. I think uh, Dr. Nickerson said that. No one can tell you your thoughts. No one can tell you what you know. So people see me, people see a 22 year old black woman. They probably think a lot of things, but they don't know what I know. And that's what I know. So just keep acting like that. Stay fearless. So uh, with that, uh, thank you, panelists. I'm going to turn it back over to the organizers, maybe Ms. Jackson or someone to close us out. Uh, we really appreciate it. It looks like Ms. McKenzie. Yes, uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Sharice McKenzie, and I'm a proud alumni of Maryland and an UMBA board member. On behalf of our board and the Black Alumni Weekend Board, I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists, and especially Dr. Nickerson, our great moderator for the evening. Thank you all for your participation in tonight's program and for imparting all this wisdom to our audience. We are so glad to have had a program like this to kick off our first preview event leading up to Black Alumni Weekend. And a special shout out to our production facilitators and the producer who helped us with the video you saw tonight. As a next step in exploring our Black perspectives, we would like you to invite, we would like to invite you to share your story. These stories will be compiled into a book that we will be unveiling during Black Alumni Weekend 2022. In the coming weeks, we will share the way that you can provide your stories and experiences. So please watch out for that invitation. Tonight's event, as you guys heard, was the first of several Black Alumni Weekend preview events that we'll be hosting. So be on the lookout for more updates via email, including another preview event that we'll be hosting in April. And also, of course, um, it is 2021. So you, you guys should also follow us on all our social uh, platforms. So we'll be dropping those in the chat. Um, and of course, because we are in Black History Month being February, although it's Black History all, <laughs> all 365 days of the year, uh, we will also be having some more events that you guys should be sure to check out. So tomorrow, um, join Umba for our financial wellness this event at seven o'clock. And also Dr. Nickerson will be hosting virtual history tours for the next three Fridays. And details and registration, of course, for all of these are listed on the website that our um, production folks will be dropping in the chat for you as well. Um, I know some folks asked about a recording of this. So yes, there will be a recording and we'll be sharing that um, through with everyone who registered for the event at a later time. And yeah, thank you all again for your time. And we hope you enjoyed tonight's event and see you next time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It was a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Terrific. Good to meet everyone. You too. Thank you for all you all do. Yes. And thank you all for sure. <laughs>